Right, so this is the question. You've been working on it as groups, and we'll just go through. I hope you've all identified a representative from your group who can answer questions. Um, and we will start... Uh, we'll start at the back with you four. So what... Just pick a point in the question. You don't have to give me a whole solution. Just pick a point that you think is, is sort of the starting point for, for doing the work. What, what's kind of the, the first way into this question? Just give me one of them, yes. what you think is the best one. So, um, we are trying to find the role of X, uh, SRDX2 in formation of synapses. So, the first approach would be to knock down the gene, uh, coding for uh, SRPX2. Uh, so, we, can't, we probably won't be able to create in vivo, in vivo models of it uh, in mice, because it that might not be possible. So uh, we were thinking something in the lines of creating in vitro models. OK. By tissue good, good. We'll move on to the next group. Um, so yeah, so what Rattles just said is, obviously, this is the protein we're interested in. The first thing, really, is a, as, a, as a biologist, biochemist, whatever molecular biologist to do, somebody says, I've got this protein. What does it do? Um, the easiest way to do it experimentally is to get rid of it and see what effect it has. Now, he said do a knockdown, which is sensible because a knockout, because this might be a developmental protein, a knockout might stop the whole developmental program, whereas a knockdown will just damp it down and it should, you should see less of whatever it does. So that's a very sensible thing to do, and he said to do it in vitro. So um, I, I think everybody's in, ended up in that direction. So let's assume that you did that as well. You suggested a knockdown in the end. Uh, okay, so you want to do a fluorescent tag. So what, what are you going to achieve with your fluorescent tag on it? So we thought, yeah, so we thought we'd do half, a ta uh, half the fluorescence on the SRPX2 and then half on one of the synapses, and then we'd see which synapse it would go to. And then so on one of the synapse proteins? Yeah. Okay, this is a good solution, actually. This is one that nobody else has come up with, which is, to, is basically to put half of your fluorescent protein on the SRPX2 and half of it on one of these, these marker proteins. And if they interact, then the fluorescence, they will only fluoresce when they interact, because that will make the whole fluorescent protein and you'll see it fluorescence. Um, so my question, though, is what if SRPX2 doesn't interact directly with any of those other proteins, which is possible, which not even form a complex with them? Because we will know that it doesn't bind to them. <laughs> OK, good, good, OK. But then what would be your next experiment, if that's not? Okay, so then you just want to measure the action potential. Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to one of the next groups. We'll see what... Uh, so, you, you three were a group. Have you got anything? So, let's assume you're doing the knockdown. Did you do a knockdown? Yes. So, what, what are you going to see from the knockdown? What's that going to show you? Okay, so you want to use microarray to, to see whether the expression level of those four proteins is reduced. Okay, that's that's a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it goes. I'm not sure it tests directly what we're looking for, but it, but it's useful information. I think that's, that's useful because obviously the the level of the mRNA doesn't necessarily correspond to the level of the protein that's produced because it depends on the stability of the protein and it, and it depends on the stability of the mRNA. So you may have a lot of mRNA that's turned over quickly. Um, it may not. So there's all sorts of issues there, but I think knowing whether it has an, an effect on their expression is, is an interesting thing to know. Um, I think one possible flaw in your thinking is that this is a secreted protein, so it doesn't go to the nucleus. So my initial thought would be it probably doesn't have an effect on expression because it's not going to the nucleus; it's going to the extracellular site. But it could have an indirect. It could have an indirect effect on expression, so you'd be able to rule. You'd be able to decide whether there's a direct or indirect on, uh, event on expression. Um, what about you guys? So, uh, did you do a knockdown? Uh, yeah, and we also came up with the idea of that you could um, look at which syn well, the number of synapses are being formed, and if you fluorescently label the um, proteins that are mentioned, you can identify what type of synapse it is as well. 
Yeah. Okay. Which ones it's affecting. So, so these proteins, what, what these guys are saying is these proteins are your marker proteins, which is obviously what, what this group has said as well. Um, so if you're getting more excitatory synapses, you should see more of these proteins because there'll be more excitatory synapses with these proteins in them. And, and so if you fluorescently label these proteins, you can then directly look and see, are there more excitatory synapses in this particular cell line that I'm growing? Um, and equally, you can mark your inhibitory ones and say, are there more inhibitory ones of the same number or are there fewer? Um, and so they're using, you're using GFP tags, are you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we just talked about this. Are there any, are there any problems with using a GFP tag? We talked about, I thought this one. Oh, well, well I'll, I'll, I'll ask you guys. Are there any problems with using a GFP tag or, or a variant? So, I think that GFP is uh, like, um, I know like one of the ways to process so it could interact with the structure of the, of the receptor. And so is there another solution? I mean, it's a good idea, but are there, is there an alternative? Okay. Okay. So, th so this is an alternative to doing. It's actually easier to do because you don't have to make constructs. And if you make a construct with a fluorescent tag, then it's competing with the non-fluorescent ones unless you remove the native ones and replace them. And that's quite an involved thing. And then your fluorescent tag, your GFP or your BFP or whatever may actually interfere with some protein-protein interactions or something. So you'd need to show that it wasn't doing that if you were using that solution. Whereas if you just take the cells and you have an antibody against these proteins with a fluorescent tag on it, you can, you can see directly in the microscope that way. Um, and I, this was mentioned in your lectures very briefly. This is mentioned in the, in the facts lectures that Alessandro De Maio gave you. I don't think he mentions it in his microscopy lectures directly, but, but it is a common technique. So immuno... Uh, what's it called? Immunocyto chemistry, I think. But anyway, basically, you, you, you grow, you, you, in fact, you can buy antibodies against these ones already, these four, which is not something I'd expect you to know, obviously, but, but you can actually buy them. They're, they're common enough. People are interested enough in these marker proteins that, that companies sell antibodies with fluorescent tags on them already. But if they didn't, you can make your own antibodies and add your own fluorescent tags onto them. Um, and so you could do that. There isn't, or there wasn't, at least in 2013, when this work was done, that this question is based on an antibody already available for this, so the, the group doing it had to make their own antibody and put their own tag on for this protein, but there is for, for this one. Okay, so at the moment we can knock down the protein and we can, so the key protein, SRPX2, um, we can use either fluorescent tags such as GFP or better immunocytochemistry um, to, to, to see whether there's, the levels of these are changing through the microscope um, potentially we could do that with, um, with proteomics as well. You could use that with mass spectrometry. You could, you could take samples out and you could, you could use SILAC or something. Uh, and you've had the lectures, so you probably know better than I do. But, so there are other ways of trying to quantify the, the amount as well. Because so you, you want to quantify. So if you're going to do it with, with fluorescence as well, you probably need a computer to count up how many points there are. And you need to show statistically that you've got a change so but basically a t-test, although because you're doing multiple comparisons, it would be an ANOVA test. Um, so what else can we do? So we're knocking down and we're counting and we're seeing maybe there's more inhibitory or more excitatory synapses. So you're the last group. Do you have what else might you do? What other experiments? Have you got any more experiments you could do? Um, you mean if you connect a fluorescent tag like JFP and Cherry on the... It could do. It could be a problem. You could change. If you put the fluorescent tag on, such as GFP, you, you could interfere with interactions that that protein would make. Or you might even change the structure of the protein, although that's less likely because you'd normally have a linker in between. But that, that, that fluorescent protein might interfere with interactions with other proteins. And that this happens... I mean, people use GFP all the time, and it's a useful tool, but that a protein of the size of GFP can cause that effect, we know, because ubiquitin, which is a much smaller protein, 
is used for that exact role in the cell. It's used to modify the interactions of proteins with other interactions. That's what ubiquitin does. And indeed, phosphate is used. Phosphorylation is a mechanism for changing how one protein interacts with another protein. These small changes can affect the, 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 how the cell works. So you can use a GFP tag, um, but the question would be, how do, you, how do you confirm in experiment your GFP tag is not affecting the experiment? Whereas if you use an antibody instead, you do the experiment, and then you, you're just using the antibody to help you look at it. The antibody binds. It shouldn't interfere with the system because the system is as it is. The antibody binds, and you can use the fluorescent tag. So, uh, somebody here wants to uh, want to use antibody to link your four protein. Is anybody use just to use antibody to link four protein? What do you mean to link? Uh, I don't want to link antibody. I just want to change another thing to link our four protein. We could link uh, flag. Flag is only shorts. Yeah, you could put a flag tag on. Yeah, flag yeah. tag on for protein. Yeah, I mean, again, you'd still need to prove that it doesn't have an effect. But, uh, it's not likely to, so it's less, it's less of a problem. But, but, but the point of flag is it, it's designed to interact with stuff. That's what it, you put it there to, as an interaction tag. Well, you're going to use an antibody, but it could interact and with... And compare you um, linking antibiotic and... Uh, uh, GFP. Okay, okay, but you, you, yeah, yeah, okay. But how would you take the experiments further? So we, we, we can we can use we can use GFP. You could use it. I'm saying you can use it, but you'd need to do some checks. That's fine. I, I, I don't need a long discussion on it. What other experiments can you do? Where can you? How can you take this further? Um, did you did you do anything further? Do you? I mean, you did. You did another. You you, you described another experiment to me, which I don't think. Well, they've sort of described a similar experiment, but but. I think, didn't you not describe, you said yeast two hybrids? Yeast hybrids. Oh, no, you guys yeah. said yeast two hybrids. Yeast hybrids, yeah, yeah, yeah. Used, 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 used hybrids yeah. to detect the uh, direct uh, interaction of, among... Yeah, OK. Proteins. Which is what these guys were doing as well with the split fluorescence. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same principle. You split a functional unit and then... OK, does anybody, anybody have any further experiments they would do? I mean, the moment we've done knockdown, we've, we've tried to count up whether there's more excitatory or inhibitory... Anybody? Wave a hand. Yes. So we we thought of rescuing the phenotype. Okay. Yes, this was a good one. I remember you said that. So can you explain that a bit more? Yes. Okay. So. If you're putting in, so you're going to do a knockdown with siRNA or a short herpin RNA, and you need to find ways to control for the fact that you may have off-target effects. So you may, maybe your, your siRNA knocks this down, but maybe it knocks something else down as well. So, so how are you going to confirm that it's really the knocking down of this that's causing the effect that you're seeing if, if you then see this change inhibitory? And so what they're saying is, well, you need to put this back into the system and that's all you're going to put back into the system, and then you rescue it. Now, how, how do you put it back into the system? Yes. So one thing is you could add purified protein, but that's obviously going to have a short period. But you're saying you want to add the plasmid. So you're going to add the plasmid that expresses the protein, but you're also going to add a short interfering RNA that knocks the protein down. You're right, you're right, but you're not quite right. So... Just the purified protein. Just the purified yeah, yeah. protein. And then we can run Western blocks uh, to check for uh, the from DSD. Yeah, yeah, so you could do that. You could add the exogenous protein. But, but this idea of adding the plasmid is, is, is actually a better idea. It's just the way it's been described at the moment, it won't work. So the question is, how do you make it work? 
Okay, I'll tell you the answer. So the siRNA is designed to target a specific sequence of bases. But, sorry? No, but you're thinking along the right lines. But, um, so you can have multiple sequences of bases that code for the same protein. So the plasmid you add back in to express your SRPX2, you put in a different gene sequence. It still expresses the amino acid sequence of SRPX2, but it's not complementary to the siRNA that's blocking, knocking down the wild type. Yeah, it's very clever. I didn't think of it. I wouldn't have thought of it. I just read the paper. I mean, I might have thought of it eventually, but, but and I'm sure it's a standard technique in the field, but whoever came up with it was, was obviously thinking about the problem quite carefully. So, so uh, can we not use CRISPR technology to add the SRPX2 uh, gene again? Uh, to rescue the... Uh, so to put in a different variant? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, you could. I mean, it's the same as adding in a plasmid, so that's... Yeah, you could, you could if you wanted. Yeah, you know, you, could, you could use it to knock it out, and then, yeah, there are variants you can do with CRISPR. Um, so let me just see what else I've got on my list. I think we've done quite a lot. So what about in vivo work? Because we've talked about in vitro work. We haven't talked about in vivo. I think a couple of you... Groups did talk about in vivo work. Does anybody want to suggest any in vivo work they could do? We, we tested fluorescence in one of them in vivo. You would test? Yeah, because we can speed up fluorescence intensity. In vivo, in, so you're going to take fluorescent marked, so you're using GFP tags and you're putting them in and, and seeing what, what, where they localize in, in an actual brain. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you could do that. That would be. That might show you something if you have a control and a non-control. Are there any other ex experiments you could do that might relate? I mean, there's part of the question we haven't really even addressed yet. So it turns out you can look at speech disorders in mice, yes. So again, if you read the paper, uh, it turns out that, that pups, so baby mice, have this thing called subvocalization that, that they talk to the, the mother. When they're separated from their mother, they make this, this, this noise. And, and when you knock down this protein, they make less of the noise. So, so, so you, you, can, you can. You can actually look at the subvocalization um, and, and, and measure it. So... Um, so they also did experiments taking the human disease variant, and they used that in, 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 in vitro, in fact. They used that to show that that would inhibit the, cell, the, the synapse formation, the excitatory ones. So that there are various things. So, so there's quite a lot you can do. And you all between you did quite a good job of, of putting together quite a good program of work. I say this is a much harder question than you'd, you'd get in an exam. But in a way, this is practice, as I say, for the critical review as much as it is for an exam question and sitting down and thinking, you know, what are the controls? Could they have done it this way? Could they have done it that way? Did they do enough controls? Will the GFP, which is so common, did they control to see whether it would have an effect? Did they need to control or is it obviously it's not going to have an effect in this case? Things like this, these sorts of questions. Um, I think that's more or less everything that we could have gone through. Um, so that's the paper. The slides are online, so you can, you can just look on Canvas and, and pull out the name of the paper. It's from 2013. Um, this is a sort of list of all the things we've talked about. I think there's a few things missing off this list that I could have added, um, and maybe I should add them later. But, but that's got most of the things. You may want to add your own if you've got anything else. But, and I say you can read the paper. Um, I don't think it's the easiest paper to read, actually. They haven't written it in, in the most accessible way, but since we've talked about it, I'm, I'm sure you can make progress on it and maybe get some more ideas um, if it interests you. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I think we can wrap this up. Yes? Well, 
Well, I think most people don't bother testing it. They just assume, but it, but it is at the, you know, there's lots of things people assume in the lab, and then it turns out 10 years later that they shouldn't have assumed them. Um, and and these, these come up every once in a while. There was a, I, it was five or 10 years ago, there was a whole lot of labs that suddenly discovered they weren't using the cell lines they thought they were using because nobody bothered to test them properly. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. I mean, it's not an area I work in. I was just aware that this had happened. And, and you know, none, none of those groups disappeared into thin air through bad scientific practice because they were all doing it. And, and I guess their results were still valid. They just had to be reinterpreted in a different framework. So, um, but if you're being critical of people's work, then it's something you might want to raise Well, or think about. Well, might the GFP have an effect at this point? And a common thing that people do actually is put GFP on the N terminus and then put it on the C terminus and see whether that makes any difference because it's unlikely that you, if the GFP is causing an effect, it's unlikely you would see the same result if it's on the N terminus as you see it's on the C terminus. Um, so there are things that people do do in experiments to worry about that, but sometimes they, they don't worry about it as well. Um, so one thing we didn't talk about, actually, a common thing for uh, siRNA is to put randomized, take the sequence you put in and randomize it and put that in as well, just to show that a sequence of that composition and that length doesn't have an effect per se on, on, the, on your experiment. That's a common control. Again, that's, that's actually in the paper. Um, Any more questions? Uh, maybe we could do extra experiments and uh, we link GFP and the full protein here. We just uh, inject SRPX2 and the full protein link GFP to see the to see the thing X2 and the full protein link GFP to see the you could do. I'm not sure whether we inject ready -made. I'm not sure whether you, if you inject the marker proteins. I mean that may or may not work. If if the marker proteins are in the synapses, um, like V-glut is an ion channel, for example. So it probably needs to go through the endoplasmic reticulum and through the Golgi stack to get into the membrane to be inserted properly. And if you just inject it, you may find it never gets into the membrane, so it may not, it just may not get to the right location. SRPX2 is a secreted protein, so sure, there's no problems with injecting that. That's going to be the same as it. But if you inject the other ones, you may find, if you just inject the raw protein, it may not, it may not work. It may work, it may not work. So again, that's, that's. And this key answer is come up, is come up, uh, is, is from a real paper. Yeah, it's from a real paper, yes. And we can find a paper on Yes, the, 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 the title of the paper is in the slides for this talk, which are on canvas already. So it's this paper. Nice to see this paper is that, uh, section B is more about uh, protein interaction. No, section B is, here's a problem, please solve it. And this is a problem, please solve it. And the point is you can take any scientific paper that's published in the literature, preferably a good one, and you could get together as a group, and one of you could take the paper and turn it into a question like this and give it to the others to answer. And you could take, so it's a way you can practice for this, this part of the... So if you're already reading papers, and you, you could say, oh, OK, this, this could be an interesting paper. I could turn this into a question and give it to my friends and see how they do, and we can compare how they do against the actual question, the actual solution. So it's, it's sort of... It's giving you a way to revise this section of the course, apart from just reading the notes, it, a way to, for you to start thinking about how science is done rather than just reading, learning, and repeating, but start trying to improve your problem solving. How do I apply what I've learned? This question was picked totally at random. This has got no significance to it apart from it's a question for you to try and work. It doesn't give you any hint about what might come up in part B or, or any such similar thing. It is totally picked at random. I just looked through the literature and thought, could I make a question out of this paper? Yeah, I could. I'll do that. That'll do. And then I read it a couple of times and tried to write it up into a format that I thought you could use. Uh, in fact, actually, I, my, my real question is about the uh, range of section B. Yes. The, I ever seen the first template you post on the canvas. The first template in section B is more talk, uh, was more talking about uh, uh, protein production. Yeah. Uh, Expression, protein... I mean, the question could be related to any of the 11 lectures you've had. Okay. 
it, it is not focused on it. And in fact, it will probably encompass more than one. Like this, this question here encompasses transfection, siRNA inhibition, reporter genes, so, um, electron, well, microscopy. Um, you know, it covers probably at least five of the lectures um, material from them all. So it's just saying, can you take what we've taught you and put it together in a way that solves the problem? Because that's what scientists do. They take the range of their knowledge and they put it together. You're not going to be able to guess what the question is. All you can do is try and practice solving problems using the techniques that you've, you've learned about. Yes? So if we answered um, this question like we did at the end all together, yes. what kind of mark would we be looking at? I have no idea. But, well, I mean, like, <laughs> I'm not... I'm not yeah, I mean, you had a complete answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and you would have like put in some technical details. So, yes, it would have been really good. The, the point is these, these, are, these are hard questions to, to, to answer that, that we know. So we, we want... I mean, it's, it's a case in general in all exams. We want to give you marks. There's no benefit to us in you failing the exam, right? So we want to find every excuse we can to give you a mark. That's what we're looking for. When we're marking an exam, we're trying to find every excuse we can to give you a mark... But at the end of the day, we also need to have a certain standard because we can't pass people who don't have the knowledge. So there's always this debate, which we have in, with the second markers at that point where people are at the borderline, which is thankfully relatively few people of, but we want to give them as... We don't want... But really, they're just not good enough. We can't... They're going to have to do a reset because... And so... But we want to we want to give you as many marks as we can, but we know there's got to be a standard as well. So if you give us an excuse to give you a mark, we'll take it. But if you, if you don't display any knowledge at all, obviously we can't give you any marks. And so that's, that's the balance we're looking for. And, you know, if somebody gave me a perfectly worked solution to, for, for a problem like this in the exam, I'd probably fall off my sleep, seat while marking it, you know, and you'd get 100. I'm not expecting perfect solutions. I'm just expecting you to show that you can solve a problem and you know what the issues are, particularly thinking about controls. People that are showing that they know how to put in controls and what the limitations of the methods are are going to get better marks and somebody just writes out a bunch of technical detail. So, for example, a, a question might involve protein purification. The student that just writes out their lecture notes on protein purification will probably get a pass mark. But the student that says, well, it's protein purification, but I've been told this about the protein that we're trying to purify. Um, for example, it's a human protein. Therefore, maybe bacteria are not the best purification system. Maybe I want to use some eukaryotic system to get the right, you know, the fat... You could do it in bacteria, and a solution, an answer that used a bacterial system would get a pass mark. But an answer that used maybe Pitya pastoris, which you perhaps haven't been lectured on, or at least you could acknowledge the fact that if you... Because I know you haven't been lectured on Pitya pastoris, I don't think, but, but to acknowledge the fact that a bacterial system will not necessarily put on the right post-translational modifications, therefore your purified protein may not look quite like it should do. Now, people use bacterial systems all the time, particularly for crystallography, but if you acknowledge the fact in the answer that there are flaws in that and there are other ways to do it, even if you don't know the technical detail for that, then you get the better mark. So, so that's, that's what, you know. I just realised I haven't done translate once, and it has to post translational modification. Yes, both of those points. You can't do, you can't do disulfides either. Although it can, you can put tags on it to make it export them and then they can form the disulfide bonds. Yeah. And there are tricks for actually doing it in the cytoplasm as well, but but again, you haven't been lectured on those. So. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, though. If you bring in knowledge that you've read from somewhere else, that's also. I mean, it shows somebody who's engaged with the whole process of understanding science. And again, we give you more marks for that. If you're just repeating lecture notes, then you scrape a pass, but you don't get any more merit than that because you know you haven't shown you've understood and processed it, and you can apply it. And particularly for this course, that's what this course is about, you demonstrating that you understand really what, what the methods are, you're not just repeating them. Any more questions? Uh, we didn't see any criteria in section B. Any marking criteria? Or? Yeah, marking criteria in section B. No, I haven't put them up, because I, I, we might be revising them slightly, which is why I haven't put them up, but I have to... I will put them up sometime this term. I don't... I mean, for the moment, you just need to know you need to be able to answer a question like this. And I've roughly outlined, if you can just repeat your lecture notes, it should just be about enough to get a pass. And if you can really apply your lecture notes, you understand how to use what we've lectured you about, then you get a good mark. That's, that's the basic criteria, the detailed criteria. I, I, we, will, we will put some up before the end of the term, but I haven't, haven't yet, it's true.
Any more? No? Sorry, do you need to... No, you don't need to cite articles. I mean, if, if you can, it might be beneficial, but no, there's no expectation for you to cite articles. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of benefit to it. I know in some universities... Yeah, I was... Yeah. yeah, I was told that Leeds do that as well, but I don't see what the benefit of it is. What we want to know is you understand the material, and the citation is... I mean, I'm not going to go and check all the citations, and I certainly don't know most of them. I know some, but... You know, so I don't see you could. Yeah. Yeah. No, it seems a bit pointless, and we don't do that at any level in the university. I mean, we you, it's expected on your 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 dissertation and so on, but in an exam, it's we're interested in your understanding, not your ability to remember lists of names and dates. I mean, that's history, right? We're not doing history; we're doing science. So. Any more? Good, thank you very much.